Hey friends, how are you? It's Mr. McKinney here with Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston. Excited to be on the live show with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Here we are going to learn about early Radio Houston history with the one and only Christopher Varela. You know what? We're excited to offer this show. It happens again on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. You can share this video real quick. Let your friends know to tune in uh, to watch the show. Uh, Christopher Rawls is going to be on the show very shortly, but first, we always have with us our wonderful executive director, Allison Bell, to tell us about what's going on with the hair ties. So welcome, Allison Bell, onto the show to be able to tell all of us what's going on here at the Hair Society. Hello, Allison. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Well, let us know what's happening here at the Hair Society. Sure. Well, we just had our luncheon last week um, that turned out to be virtual. We were hoping to have it in person, but of course, due to the pandemic, we ended up having a virtual event. We are still working out some technical issues, um, but it was a success. We filmed it at the Ballroom on the Bayou, which is owned by one of our board members, Kirksey Gray. Yeah. Decorated beautifully, um, had these lovely flowers and tablecloths, and uh, so we we filmed there, and then our speaker was filmed in uh, Colorado, so we're still piecing all of that together, and our speaker was J.P. Bryan. Um, and I wanted to let you all know our silent auction is still up until tonight, till midnight tonight. You can still bid on some items. We have some really great items still. Yeah, how some appropriate. So tonight's the night. Tonight's now, where can they go real quick? What's the website they can go to to learn about what they can sure. buy? Sure, it's um, 32.org. 32auctions.org slash THS2020. It's also on our website. If, if Absolutely. So go to theheritageside.org first and foremost, yes. and, and then you can go and click through there. But go ahead and bid on some items because yes. uh, tonight at midnight is the deadline uh, for the auction. Of course, it benefits the great projects that we're doing here at the Heritage Society. So we do need your support, and you get some really good items, yeah. including things like hotel oh, stays. Right, right. Yeah. And actually, there are a couple of bus tours on Mr. McKinney's historic bus that are still... Actually, there's a bidding war going on for his bus tour of the um, the haunted houses. Oh, there's yeah. You know, the haunted Houston tour that we give. <laughs> yes. So I think our, I think our king and queen are, are bidding against that yes. with some other folks, and too. So folks, yes. love that. So if you want to bid on some items, make sure you go, once again, to heritageside.org, heritageside.org, to go ahead and bid on some of those items. You have till midnight tonight to be That's able to right. do so when it closes. Antiques as well. Yeah, there's some actually some of the furniture in this room. Yeah, how about that? Which has been deaccession. That beautiful piece was in the Stadi House. Um, and you can even come see it. This is the beautiful ballroom where we were. And there's a package um, for this as well? Oh, absolutely. 50 of your closest, 49 of your closest friends. Uh, you can purchase that and have your own private party. It is. It, fill, it holds 1,000 people. So you can be socially distanced and you can be out on the balcony, which looks across to the Wortham. It is so pretty. His space is very, very lovely. I love that. So there it is. Uh, and then once again, more items too. We've got some day spa packages, yes. some Japanese day spa packages, everything Thank else. You. Thank you. For now, that. talk about oh, this sure. big exhibit because it's getting a lot of attention, by the way, and a lot of people are talking about it. Let people know what's going on sure. exhibit-wise. So, of course, our museum is still open Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. And there is a virtual tour, though, because if you're not comfortable coming downtown, virtual tour. Uh, only $5 because that's what you pay if you came in our museum um, and you follow these little circles as I mentioned before. Um, this tour is getting a lot of publicity. Uh, we actually were in a, a women's club not long ago on a Saturday and they recreated this entire exhibit um, and we got a lot, we sold a lot of items, a lot of merchandise, so it is getting a lot of attention which we're very excited about. Now, also, too, another way people can support oh. the Heritage Society is to some rental options that we have here. Talk about some of the spaces that are available for rentals. Sure. This is the beautiful Connolly Plaza. It holds up to 350 people. So I have an outdoor wedding here in May, which, of course, has been rescheduled several times. Um, it's a beautiful brick plaza that Mrs. McNair uh, remodeled and updated in 2002. So we do weddings. We've had corporate uh, event spaces. This is our front patio right here and the art car parade used to go by there and this is a really fun place to watch things happening on Bagby Street. And it's Long Row by the way. It's an yes. historical part of our replica rather of an historical part. Sandra Lord actually wants us to repaint this blossom peach so yeah, if you're listening. Uh, well because it was a, it, according to her in the records that? that she found that's how it used to be. So you know Sandra Perhaps. Lord she's going to be one of our she's guest speakers remember. coming up. Yeah. She's going to know the facts. So there yeah. you go. But really Long Row is a wonderful way to kind of just really take us back to Houston's early commercial days. And once they and finish updating the Bagby Street corridor this will be beautiful because they're expanding that street. They're making it more pedestrian 
and friendly. So yeah. we'd love to be on that. No, those are all great things that are happening at the Heritage Society. Now, this also space is available as well. Talk about yes, this. Yes, sure. This is the garden behind the Stadi House. The Stadi House, uh, when it was in Westmoreland District, they had a huge, beautiful garden. So we've recreated that. This is an old uh, antique armillary um, that tells the positions of the sun. Um, and, but look at all the parks department does a wonderful job of taking care of all of these flowers. So this would be. And a the weather's space. getting nice now. Yeah. So if you if you're looking at things to do uh, here at the Heritage Society, uh, come come tour the houses. You are by the way offering tours once again. We've just reopened oh, yes. that process. Tell the audience members yes. about that. Kean and his staff will take you on a, your own private tour. We want you to make a reservation or let us know. We are taking tours six people or less from the same household, and. Um, you can book it online or you can call ahead um, and book your own tour. We've got four choices a day. So we're excited to offer those again. Um, and of course, we're practicing yeah. the socially distanced. So last week, as many of y'all know, uh, we have no prizes now because, <laughs> tell people what happened. Total debacle. The internet. Oh, okay. I mean, it was, we had a ter terrible internet issues in the San Felipe cottage. Yeah. Which is so sad. So we had to air the show as a yeah. watch party a little bit later on. So that means that it wasn't live. It was taped live, but it wasn't aired live. So right. we don't feel like uh, some of the folks that chimed in on the prizes, there were other people that also called in. So because of that, we're going to go ahead and not, um, uh, you know, work on the on the prize this time. But we'll do that next time for sure. In fact, you're going to have five tonight. questions tonight, tonight yes. uh, by Christopher Varela. And at that point, also, we'll have some prizes for you. So don't worry. Yeah. The prize will be back. Uh, yeah. We just think it was only the fairest thing to do was yeah. because it's an even playing field. So it is going out live right now. So those folks who are listening and can still chime in, by the way, we're monitoring it right now on all of our little sites and laptops over here so that we can let people know uh, what's going on. Well, thank you so much, Allison of Bell. Course. Thanks for joining us. Thank and uh, we're going to get on with the program. Here. Right. Yeah, thank here we go. Well, I also want to make sure that I mention uh, Kirksey Gregg because they were very kind to do our studio for us. If you look around now, you can kind of see uh, what we have here. I'll show you kind of just uh, this whole space over here, courtesy of the awesome folks over at Kirksey Gregg uh, Productions, and we do appreciate them. So thank you so much. And as Allison mentioned earlier, one of the items that you can bid on tonight is actually um, a, a space for you and your 49 closest friends to be inside this awesome uh, space over here at, uh, at, at the ballroom at Bayou Place. So there it is. Thanks again to Kirksey Gregg. By the way, she's back. Kimber Fountain's going to be joining us. She's our very next speaker, Kimber Fountain, next Wednesday, September 30th. You can tune in to see Kimber Fountain uh, here at the Heritage Society. She'll be talking about Galveston history and specifically the 120th anniversary of the Great Storm of 1900. So she'll be talking about that on Wednesday, September 30th, here at the Heritage Society. Do not miss out. And it's about her book, The Galveston Seawall Chronicles, her very first book that she wrote. And she's offering viewers of the show a very special offer, free shipping and a personal autograph book if you do it between now. And she's actually extended September 20th until the end of the month. So you have a couple more days to take advantage of this. You do have to go to her site, by the way. You can go to her website. Promo code is Seawall120. Seawall120, you go to kimberfountain.square.site to be able to uh, to get that book at uh, free shipping, which will save about 10 bucks. So it's a really good deal right there. Once again, Seawall120. We love Kimber Fountain. She's also, by the way, offering this to all three of her books. So if you happen to uh, want to get all three, you can do that with also free shipping. So once again, she's offering that opportunity. Do not miss out on that. Please join us on that date. Uh, September 3rd, but get the book in advance so you can go ahead and follow along all about Galveston's 120th anniversary of the seawall. Now, Wednesday, October 27th is a big day for us here at the Heritage Society because it's a homecoming for the one and only Barry Scardino Bradley. And she's written numerous books on Houston history and Galveston history. And she's going to be with us talking about her entire legacy, by the way. 40 plus years of preservation here in the Houston area focused on that. Former executive director for AA Houston. And then more importantly, her collection of books. She'll talk about them. And she has two new books out that you probably have heard of. One is about the legacy of Howard Barnstone called uh, Making Houston Modern. And the other one is her uh, book that uh, she also has called The Improbable uh, Metropolis. So all these books are available on Amazon and different avenues, but she'll be talking about us. She'll be talking about all of this on October 7th, Wednesday, October 7th, in two weeks. Do not miss out. Barry Scardino Bradley. And coming up also, a brand new book that's out. Lots of brand new books for y'all to be able to learn about Houston history is Sandra Lord's book, her very first book, The Ghost of Houston's Market Square, is out. She'll be live on our show October 14th. We're excited to have her here in studio. So once again, stay tuned every single Wednesday at 7 o'clock 
on Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston and the Heritage Society's uh, social media sites. Thank you, thank you, thank you to George Slaughter who joined us last week or sorry, two weeks ago. It was great to have him talk about Spring Branch history on on on, on this, uh, the ninth of that. We really appreciate that. So if you missed his show and past shows, you can check out these shows on YouTube, our YouTube channel, the Heritage Society. There it is. We only have a small number of subscribers, so we need your help to get that number up. If you have a Gmail account, you actually also have a YouTube channel, a YouTube account rather, and you can like our page real quick and subscribe. And you can also check out past videos as well, like historical tours that we have, tours on architecture, African American history, it's all available at the Heritage Society's uh, YouTube channel page. There it is, YouTube. All right. Uh, we also want to invite you to like and follow Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston and the Houston History Bus because we offer a variety of free tours on board the bus when you do that. And the fall weather is coming up, so we've got some great tours that are happening. So please like and follow Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston and the Houston History Bus to join us on board for those awesome free tours that we have. Okay, there's a sites one last time before we get going because our very special guest is in studio. He is here, ready to go. We want to welcome Christopher Varela, the author of uh, Cotton Port and Rail Center, An Early History of Radio in Houston. Come on down, Mr. Christopher Varela. All right, Happy you. to have you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Well, sit on down. We're going to get cooking all about Houston history over here and talk about radio history specifically. I'll get those out of your way. Great. Uh, these are the books you mentioned earlier. This is his book, by the way. Definitely zoom in on that and check that out. How awesome is that? That is his book, Cotton Port and Rail Center, A History of Early Radio in Houston. Uh, we did, by the way, mention uh, the book earlier. I was supposed to show these earlier. So here you go. This is Kimber Fountain's book that she has. And then, of course, Sandra Lord. So they're all going to come on the show. But right now we're talking about this book over here, the one and only Christopher Varela. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You, My pleasure. Well, let's do this. Let's get it going. I'm going to get all of our awesome uh, you know, people are chiming in with great questions. Guys, your questions are important. So if you have questions, we've got this... Uh, uh, system here. Look at this. We got Tina Hay. We got uh, Mark Gartner. We got Christy Varela. Christy Varela, you know her? No, I don't. You don't? Really? No, oh, I don't. She That's sounds, a good one. <laughs> oh, well, hey, you, well, she, maybe she's related. Uh, you know, David Azaga's on. Janet uh, Reichnick, Allen, and Mary Meredith are on. Gwen Ferguson is on. So lots of great folks that are chiming in. Please, please, please continue to share this because we want people to learn about Houston history and especially radio history with Christopher Varela. So here we go. Well, let me let you take it away. Let's just talk about your book and all the work that you've done over the years because this is really exciting to be able to have an opportunity to learn about radio history because you focused on this in a special way. This book is chock full of great information and also photos as well, which we're going to go over a lot of these. But it's a lot of great content, and you're not going to get this anywhere else. So we are absolutely honored to have you in studio with us talking about this. Tell people a little about yourself because um, you're, you're a passionate historian when it comes to radio history, but you're also the chair for the Harris County Historical Commission. So we know we got some folks out there listening and watching that know about the commission themselves, but for the folks that don't know about those, you know, black and silver markers of all around Harris County, tell folks about the commission. Yeah, we're like a local arm of the Texas Historical Commission, and our mission is to promote, document, and preserve uh, history of Harris County. So we do that primarily through the... Uh, Texas Historical Commission marker program. So any markers you see out there uh, uh, that uh, have the uh, Texas Historical Commission on it, that's what we uh, oversee here on a local basis. Awesome. So there you go. You now know those black and silver markers that you see. There's a local arm here. By the way, if people have an idea for a subject matter, maybe they have an historical building, an historical house that was owned by somebody, how do people go about getting one of those markers put in front of their place of business or their house? How does it happen? Well, generally, you have to, you have to submit what is a narrative, and it has to be formatted a certain way. Uh, we at the Harris County Historical Commission can help you with that, and really it justifies the subject. The subject uh, and so it has to be like over, like a building has to be over 50 years or an event has to have happened 50 years ago. If you want to document a person, that person has to have passed away at least 20 years ago and so forth. So there's different guidelines that need to be followed. But generally, yes, you write basically a research paper to justify your subject. And then you pay a fee to get that marker made. It takes about a couple of years, so don't think it's just going to be done in one weekend. It takes a while. Uh, we approve it locally, and then we send it up to the state where they do the final approval on it. But with 
as you know, with any bureaucracy, it takes time. It takes time. And I think it's also important to know that we encourage the individual applying that they're responsible for all that work. They sometimes they have a misconception that we will guide them through the process, but we're not going to write the narrative for them. That is really the job no. of the individual, That's correct. as it should be, right? Because then they learn about yeah. the journey and the history behind what they're trying to really focus on. And then more importantly, the information then gets vetted and gets done a certain way. It's cited. Mm -hmm. And then we as a committee get to oversee that information and then and then add our own uh, you know, possible, uh, you know, uh, you know, bits of information, and or be that, you know, check and balance for that process. And then the markers themselves are not paid for uh, by us, right? That's important. They're privately too. funded. That's correct. It used to be two thousand, but now we lost the foundry yeah. who was making them, and we're looking for a new foundry to make them. And uh, yeah, we were expecting for them. But it's to go important on. that people know that we, we, you know, we as a commission don't pay for the markers. No, we don't. You know, that's something that uh, there, there are grant processes out there, there but that's a rare opportunity to really. Need to people know that there needs to be some funding aside for that too. But the most important thing is that we're saving history. We're educating people about what's happening in the area. We have quite a few markers here at the Heritage Society, all sprinkled throughout our park as well. We'd love to have more, and that's kind of the idea behind it. So, well, let's jump right into early radio history here in Houston. Uh, let us know what we're looking at right here. Okay, let's start. Our story starts about over 100 years ago. Uh, imagine a time when there was a, we had telephone. We had the telegraph system, but we didn't have television, and we certainly didn't have radio. So these two gentlemen you see here are what dubiously they got uh, Houston's inception into radio going. The gentleman that's seated is Dr. Lee Forrest. He was a well-known radio scientist in his day, and so he prom he was promoting radio communication over 100 years ago. So uh, what better way to promote his uh, radio communication than to commercialize it. So he went out to try to commercialize it. Unfortunately, he went in with some bad businessmen. And the gentleman who's seated, uh, standing there, his name is Abraham White, and he was uh, known for being a unethical businessman. They would often sell uh, stocks uh, that really were worthless to, uh, to the public. And in this case here, Lee DeForest, uh, he incorporated his company and he got into business with Abraham White, and they went around the nation to begin selling stock in their company. Unfortunately, uh, Lee DeForest didn't put a lot of effort into his radio communications, and so they were kind of like selling snake oils, if you, if you will, oh, man. to the public. Well, this company got into Texas, and by 1904, they, uh, they established a, a station in Galveston, and they had one here in Houston in 1906, and they also developed one in Beaumont. Now, uh, we're talking about telegraphy here, not voice. So just to give your audience a, a, what it would be like, this is what was being transmitted. This kind of communication, Morse code. So this is called wireless telegraphy. So this is what was being transmitted over the airways at that time. There was no practical voice communication yet. Lee DeForest would do that several years later. But yes, uh, they established a station here in Houston, but it was just really just a demonstrational and ex exhibition to try to sell stock in their company. But they weren't really promoting the technology. They were really enriching themselves. Next slide. Yeah, and here is an ad they put out in the Houston Daily Post, 1904. The forest wireless telegraph system, they were promoting the glowing pros uh, promises of this new technology called radio telegraphy. So you can see here they were selling stock from J Jason Trevent. Oh, the Vince building. There it is. 210 Vince building. So the second floor of the Vince building right there at the corner of Texas and Maine. The Jacob Vince building right over there. Built in 1896, Houston's very first skyscraper at six stories tall. How exciting. That, that's a pretty premier. That's where Jesse H. Jones had his offices originally back in 1898. Mm -hmm. So how about that? Yeah. So, so they put up their station in 1906 here. And like I said, uh, they weren't really uh, in the uh, concern with promoting the, the science of radio. They were really trying to enrich themselves on this. So they were selling snake oils, as I said earlier. Uh, and, and within a few years, they were indicted. The, the wow. federal government came in and indicted them on, on stock fraud. These two guys, check it out. Yeah. Well, actually, he escaped a conviction, but Abraham White was convicted of, of stock fraud. Man. But, yeah, Lee DeForest, he survived. 
Well, underneath that whole business of the radio communication, uh, the amateur radio operators came to flourish. And this gentleman here is a, uh, Alfred Patrick Daniel. He's probably, I would call him the, uh, the father of radio broadcasting. Uh, he was born in 1889 in Austin. And uh, a few years later, he and his family moved here to Houston. And the story goes that in 1906, uh, while DeForest was building their station here just across the uh, Buffalo Bayou, uh, he went over there, checked it out, and got into radio telegraphy as an amateur radio operator. So, uh, and this started, this was going around the country, a whole subculture of young men were building their own little radio sets and, and communicating with each other, kind of like a chat room type of thing nowadays. And so they, they were the ones that were promoting the uh, radio technology as well. Next slide, please. And you can see here, this is a, a radio set he had at his home. He's dictating apparently a message that he's receiving. You can see he's a receiver there. On top there is a part of the antenna system for it. Uh, yeah, yep, that was, uh, that's what he was well known for. Next slide, please. This is another photo of, of some of his equipment. Uh, you can see up here the Morse code uh, ch chart up there, and you can see some earphones down here. I like this, uh, check out this, this uh, switch, electrical switch they have there on the wall there to <laughs> power it up. The on and off switch, there yep, it is. Yep, and you see an antenna up there, that spiral arrow, that is an antenna. Now, this was all done on the AM frequency. That's important to note. Yeah, FM was not yet, FM was not uh, being uh, used, utilized yet. And certainly we didn't have television yet. But this was done on the AM dial. Next slide, please. There was uh, a company here called a Texas company. We know them as Texaco. You remember Texaco, the old Absolutely. one? Absolutely. Right, so they were founded back in 1902 in, in, in Beaumont, actually, Beaumont, Texas. And it was Jesse H. Jones who builds this 10-story building here in 1908 mm -hmm. that actually lures uh, Jesse H., uh, uh, Joseph Cullinan, rather, from Beaumont to Houston and he builds this building here, but I think we're probably, that's the one you want to focus on, right? Yeah, the one yeah. behind it. No, right here, this way. By 1910, they also established a radio communication system for their company, and you can see uh, an example there of the radio tower above the building, and they were using it to uh, communicate with their ships out at sea that were transporting oil and like that, so. Uh, yeah, that's why they established radio. Yeah, and it makes sense the corporations would have an interest in that, too, and they certainly have the money to play around with the equipment and the ideas, but certainly. that's also kind of forefront is to kind of get that communication out there, and what better way than to do it at the top of their building, so. Mm -hmm. All right, this is, like I said earlier, the, uh, the young men out there that became amateur operators, uh, this is uh, an early picture of the Houston Radio Club. You see down here at the bottom is Alfred Patrick Daniel. Uh, by the 1920s, he served as a president of the radio club. And some of these uh, young men you see in this photo would go on to be some of Houston's first radio broadcasters. Uh, uh, Howard Hughes, I understand, was part of the radio club. So I looked in here to see if he was in there, but I don't see him in there. I don't see him either. I know Michael Bloodworth is watching. Our buddy Michael Bloodworth over there is watching. Kim uh, Linda just signed on. Thanks so much, Kim, for doing that, for, for being a part of here. Um, but, yeah, Michael Bloodworth would know Howard Hughes more than anybody because he's always – he's got lots and lots of photos. But, yeah, I don't see him here either, and I know what he looks like as a young man as well. Mm -hmm. And I uh, don't see him in there either. No, so. I don't, no. All right, so now we get to World War I. And oh, what year was the photo taken, by the way? Do we know what year that this photo was That would be about taken? 1920, but the Houston Radio Club started in the 1910s. Okay, so the 19-teens and 10s is when the radio, Bill, Bill Bremer's uh, asking that question, too. So we think the photo was taken about 1920. That looks pretty consistent with the outfits as well, the clothing. So there you go. About 1920 uh, is the uh, photo. All right, so now we get to World War I. And on the local level, we had a couple of bases. And this is here is a photo of Ellington Field. It had opened up in early 1918. Now, when it opened up in 1918, the first planes were coming in and pilots were coming in. And, of course, they needed to be taught this new cutting-edge technology called radio. They needed instructors to come in and teach these uh, pilots. So Alfred Daniel took it upon himself to enlist in the Army 
and uh, bec he became an instructor of radio at Ellington Field. Let's see the next slide, please. Uh, you can see uh, this is an old plane here, a bi-wing plane that was uh, part of Ellington Field. And you can see how uh, radio was needed for pilots, of course, to communicate. And here is Alfred Patrick Daniel, and he's with a, uh, hanging out with a couple of servicemen there. Uh, you can see them in uniform, and I believe this was around Ellington Field where they were uh, where they were lounging. Another photo shows him there, yet with another gentleman there. And what was really uh, important here, the turning point for Alfred Patrick Daniel, is that he started teaching the pilots radio telephony. Remember how we talked about to all the, before this time it was the primary radio communication was telegraphy. Well, now uh, telephony was being taught. You know, of course, it's more practical for pilots to speak through voice instead of through dots and dashes. Right? Imagine yourself trying to type out a Morse code while you're flying a plane. But uh, yes, so that's where Alfred Patrick Daniel learned the. Uh, radio telephony. And where did you go about getting these photos? You told me a fun story about that. Yes, uh, a lady by the name of Mrs. John Miller, who was the uh, niece of Alfred Patrick Daniel. She lived up in Waco, and some years ago when I was researching the book, I contacted her, and she had a, a photo album of many of these photos that she just sent them. She, she said, I don't want them, I don't need them. I'll send them to you. So much of the slideshow you, you see here of Alfred Daniel is from her photo album that I wow. received. Wow, and it also made it in the book as well. Some of the photos are in the book, so mm -hmm. you get a chance to really see some of these early, early photos of Houston radio history inside Christopher Ella's book, you know, which is which is amazing. So there we go. That's great. And then talk about this gentleman because he makes a lot of history in Houston radio's yeah. uh, scene. This is uh, Louis Piney, and as you can see, he's on my album, uh, album, <laughs> book cover. <laughs> and, uh, yes, uh, he is one of my favorite amateur operators that I cover in the book. He did some significant things uh, as an amateur. Uh, I spoke to his family. Yeah. And there's legends. Well, his brother. His brother who's still alive. still alive. He's 102, <laughs> almost 103. Yeah, I saw him yeah, last Joe year. Yeah, Joe Piney. No, Joe Piney's father. Walter Piney. Walter Piney. I know right. Joe Piney, HSPVA alumni, and just a really great guy in the music scene, jazz music scene. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Walter is still alive and kicking and oh, yeah, out there. Doing so well. Yeah, doing really well. I saw him last uh -huh. year. Yeah. So he gave me a lot of information of his brother, Louis Piney, here. And uh, they, there was family stories that Howard Hughes, as a young boy, would come over to Louis Piney's house, and uh, he would learn how to build radio sets with him. Uh, Louis Piney was also known for, uh, well, uh, he's probably credited being the, one of the first broadcasters of, of, a, of a Texas sporting event. Oh, wow. In 1921, as an amateur... Uh, they broadcasted the University of Texas Ta Texas A and M Thanksgiving game of 1921. The way it worked out was, Piney um, was part of the Houston Radio Club, and they got together with the Houston Post newspaper to uh, broadcast the, the 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 game, the play by play of the game. And what they did was there was a uh, they had a, a an amateur operator at the field who in telegraphy was typing out the the play-by-play -play over the airwaves to Lewis Piney here at his home here in Houston and then he would telephone the play-by-play -play to the Houston Post so that has been credited as, as the first broadcast of yeah. a sporting event in Texas oh my goodness look at yeah. that and another thing I, I, I found very fascinating about him was um, you know here we are in hurricane season we're always these hurricanes come and, and, and just, you know, we're, we're, we're so afraid of them and so fearful of them. Anyway, in 1919, just a little over, over 100 years ago, a Category 4 hurricane struck below Corpus Christi. And uh, back then, of course, there was no television and no practical radio broadcasting. So all communication was taken down. Telephone and telegraphy was taken down. And so through his uh, efforts with the radio club here, they were able to get uh, current information of what was going down in Corpus Christi with all the communications lying down. So because of that, he became kind of a local hero. Wow. This was in 1919. All right, this is a promotional photo that was done about 1920. 
And uh, these are probably, yeah, these are the first broadcasters of Houston. Notice their call letters, 5FL, 5DL, 5ZT, and 5EC. Right here in the middle is Alfred Patrick Daniel. You may recognize the radio set from an earlier slide that we had. But these young men would go on to be uh, the first broadcasters of Houston. You can see here, this is a promotional shot of them taking about 1920. And you can see they're all listening in on a broadcast. Broadcast was starting to take off at that time. Okay, so that's what they were doing there. And, uh, so and there wasn't much to hear on the air, right? I mean, and many programs weren't as long as we think of now. They were short programs, <coughs> and there was a lot of dead air, right? Yes, and we had to think of broadcasting diff in a different way. It wasn't, there was no commercials on, on broadcasting then, and the purpose of somebody putting on a broadcasting station was to promote an agenda, an item, or whatever. They weren't there to sell commercial time, so mm -hmm. there wasn't commercial time there. But they were there, and as we'll go further into the presentation, I'll give you examples of what exactly they were promoting. All right, this is a makeshift transmitting kit that Alfred Patrick Daniel did. Uh, you see this tube over here. This is a, a VT a tube that was made by Westing Electric, and this was the uh, this was used by the pilots at Ellington to to, to transmit voice. So when Alfred Daniel uh, was stationed at Ellington Field. He was able to get some of the equipment, bring it home, tinker with it, and he rigged up a, a phone here. It looks like an intercom system. Yeah. Right? Look at that push button. So with this, this was, a, this was about 1921, uh, and he was able to broadcast his voice over the air using this simple equipment. All right, and this is his amateur radio set. You can see up here on top, it's designated 5ZX. And you see he's holding uh, what appears to be like a telephone mouthpiece. You see there a, a, a record player there on the side. You see a trumpet speaker there on top. And there's his transmitter there as well. Now you had a question about these items down yeah, here. Yeah, look at these by the way. Can you guess what those are? Tell, tell viewers out there what we're looking at. By the way, we had a question before you do that question about this is this a postcard photo somebody asked or is it actually an actual photo taken it was an actual photo taken by alfred patrick daniel look at that part of the, the ants collection that she yes know, that's yeah. right the, uh, okay so it's an actual photo is, bill Bremer asked that question this is an actual photo uh you know at least that's what i was talking about and this is also a photo as well as a postcard this is like a postcard promotional type of thing yeah gotcha. you can see especially radio phone music so there we go. Now talk about these. What are those? Zoom into that real quick. Let people know what we're looking at there. Those are storage batteries. So that's what he was using to, to power up his radio station as well. Uh, yeah, and, and so they would use storage batteries as, as well as uh, outlets to, to power their, uh, their station or their radio, their transmitting. And, and talk what. about these. Yeah. What you see around his call letters of 5ZX are uh, QSL cards. And what a QSL card means, QSL means I'm receiving your transmission loud and clear. So that's what the code means. And so when he would go out and transmit his voice or his messages, uh, he would receive acknowledgments from around the country from other amateur operators. And then they would send their QSL cards showing that they, uh, they received his signal. So it was kind of like a badge of honor to have these postcards up there. Or these cards up there. Now you have to understand, AM signals travel, they can travel thousands of miles. Uh, when the, even today, under certain atmospheric conditions, they can, go for, they can go out far. So these guys and these early broadcasting stations that I'm going to talk about, they could be heard in Mexico, wow. in Canada, in Cuba, in Hawaii, around, you know, given that the right atmospheric conditions are there. So just imagine how important that was, that was in advertising sure, the city. Sure, you get the message out there. Exactly. Wow. All right, so now we're going to get into the early starts of uh, the first broadcasting station in Houston. This was a station owned by Benjamin James Still, and he was part of the Hurlbert Still Electric Company. They, were, they had been around since 1901, and they were a local electrical firm here in Houston, and they basically serviced uh, electrical applications for customers. They sold everything from light bulbs, 
and to uh, wiring and all of that. And they also had a service garage. And their service garage, which was off of here at McKinney and Folk, I believe, would, uh, would service automobiles and their batteries. So once again, we're, lock, we're talking about an automobile, which was cutting edge technology 100 oh, years yeah. ago, right? People, not everybody knew how to service them. So they would come into this garage and these, these gentlemen would service your electric, your, your batteries on your cars. So uh, in 1920, he started, uh, he, he, he wanted to get into the business of, of manufacturing radio sets. So they started constructing and, and selling little radio receivers in their store. And so what better way to sell your product than to get a broadcasting station on? When your customers come in and buy this thing called a radio receiver, they need, they need to know what it's, what are they getting it for, right? So they, would, they got a license to broadcast at night. So they would broadcast and, and to serve their customers who were buying receivers from them. Yeah, this uh, newspaper ad, a huge spread, it was uh, 1922. And by 1922, broadcasting really started taking off around the nation and, of course, in Houston. You can see this ad here for the Hulbert Steel Electric Company. And you can see they finally started getting the letters of WEV. <coughs> and they would broadcast at night from their service garage. And one more point I wanted to point out here. See this one here? This is also a second station here, WGAB. This was also another company here called the QRB Radio Company. They had two locations off of Capitol Avenue and Prairie. So they were also selling radio sets at those stores. And to promote their radio receivers, they put on a broadcasting station. And, you know, this, of course, you know, we've heard this debunks the rumor about everything is K in this side of this, the, the country, right? But right. that's not true. You've got some W's over here. That, that you know, people often say everything west of the Mississippi is a K, and then everything on the east is a W. We do see that with a lot of the main stations in New York, for example, in Chicago. But that's not true. We've had our stations, you know, in the early days here in Houston. And, and still, uh, Dallas has has WRR. Yeah, the still. first one in Texas, right? right. San Antonio, yeah, so the yeah. first, yep, yeah. first station in Texas. Uh, San Antonio has W O O A I. So they beat us by one year, right? 1921, yeah. they were started, I believe, mm -hmm. and we're 1922. 22, correct. Oh, correct. Dallas, telling you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, here's another spread of the WEV station. You can see the service garage there, and you can see the, the antenna, which was called a T type T antenna. It was basically two masts with uh, some uh, loose wires suspended between them. So this is what they would broadcast from at night. Alfred Patrick Daniel, you see there, would help them. He was their program manager and their operator. So he would come in at night, and they would pull out the cars from the garage and put up the, the carpeting and put up the potted plants and put up the mics and they would broadcast live music from their service garage. And so not to be un outdone, uh, Alfred Daniel also started his own broadcasting station from his house off of Bagby Street, about a half a mile down from here. And he got the call letters of WCAK. Now notice down here, uh, 263 meters. That was the frequency back then uh, measurement the, was meters. Instead, now we use kilohertz. Back then, it was meters. So nowadays, uh, in today's standards, uh, this would be 1140 kilohertz on the AM dial. Also noticed here, too, he used the slogan, where 18 railroads meet the sea. So he was advertising Houston at the time from his little radio station out of his home on Bagby Street. <laughs> now that's gonna play into later on when we talk more as he advances. So notice how he is advertising Houston through his broadcasting efforts. All right, this is a footage, uh, this is a, uh, a picture of uh, his uh, living room with the piano and a microphone, stand-up microphone there. And you can see a, a phonograph player next to it. So that was, uh, that was basically his studio. He would have live performers come in, and they would perform for about an hour, 30 minutes, and then that would be the, the extent of his broadcasting for the day. You know, and so many of us know how they used to do radio shows. We see it on old movies, for example, like somebody would walk in and they'd have, you know, 
pairs of shoes that would be knocking on something or a horse sound or a bell or a whistle. And that was just fun radio, really give people a visual of it. So this is an example. Here he's got the upright piano. He's playing some tunes, probably some intro tunes as he does his live radio show in his house. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is his home. And you can see another example of the, uh, the T antenna that was uh, suspended from his home. Uh, and there's another next photo just shows another view of that antenna system. So that was the antenna system that they would use back then. Now, Bill Berber has a question about the two men that were by the um, uh, uh, Holbert Stills station that we saw earlier. Who were those two men by chance? Uh, the one on the left was Alfred Hurlbert, and the other one was James uh, Still. Great. So there you go. That's the answer to your question, Bill, is that you have, uh, the, uh, well, you've got the Hurlbert and the Still. Yeah, they were the, the, yeah the, they were the owners of the, store, of the station, or the store and of the station. Yeah, here's another view of Alfred Patrick Daniels antenna there and where was his house by chance do we know uh, exactly it was, i think it was a 2501 bagby okay yeah which is about what a half a mile down just yeah, right there in midtown the midtown area yeah 2501 bagby is where the house used to be the one that we're looking at right now mm -hmm. uh you know so there it is right there all right this is will horowitz and in 1922 he operated probably what is my favorite broadcasting station that i covered in the book his station was w-e-a-y he would broadcast out of his Iris movie theater here off of Travis Street. Yeah. Right. And you have to understand, back in those days, there were movie houses, but there were also vaudeville. So they had stages. So what he was doing was uh, he had the novel idea of broadcasting his vaudeville act, you know, acts. It's, you know, he's paying the actors. He's paying the, the musicians Correct. to do. Might as well the musician would come it. in, right. So he would broadcast it from that. Correct. Yeah. Right. And it was a pretty ambitious station. It was. Uh, it came on at 500 watts, so in those days, 500 watts was pretty, pretty powerful. And uh, his station could be heard around the nation, uh, in Canada, like I said, South America. Apparently, also acknowledged uh, receiving his, his uh, show. Uh, he also started doing remote broadcasting. He 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 remote. He did some remote broadcasting from the Rice Hotel just across the street. Yeah. Because they would have uh, dances there. So he started uh, broadcasting from there, and then down the block was the city auditorium. Oh, yeah, you're where right. He, where he would uh, broadcast the, the fights, the boxing matches that were being done there in the early 20s. So uh, I think, yeah, he even went as far as Rice University. He was broadcasting their basketball games. So, yes, it was quite an ambitious uh, radio station that he had. It only lasted about three years. But, uh, yeah, pretty ambitious and uh, pretty ambitious man. I mean, there, there's a lot that can be talked about this man. He was very interesting. Uh, very Bill Stewart, innovative. Bill Stewart, who also focuses um, a little bit on radio history, he says the Communications Act of 1934 said that all stations east of the Mississippi would start with the W and those west of the Mississippi would start with the K. Stations uh, like, like you mentioned earlier, WRR, Waco, uh, WPBB. So there's some that obviously were grandfathered in is what you're talking about as right, well. Correct. So this is after 1930. It was before 1934. Thank yeah. you, Phil Stewart, for that. So kind of added some chiming in on there. And, of course, Phil's got a long radio history himself working in the business. So, But, yeah, that makes perfect sense because it connects with what you're saying is that prior to that, in the 1920s when radio started here in Houston, those rules didn't apply until right. after 1934. Right. And another thing about Will Horowitz is uh, – he was credited with starting the whole border radio phenomenon. Uh-huh. Talk about that. <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. That started about 1930, where uh, American businessmen and American interests were just going over the Mexican border to put up radio stations just to skirt themselves from, federal, from the American United States federal government. And when they could do that, they, could, they, they didn't have to uh, stay within the guidelines that were set so they were setting up these huge, powerful stations, like uh, 100,000 watts, which was not allowed by the federal government here in the United States. And what they were doing was just over the, across the border in Mexico, they would set up these stations, and they would use a frequency that was so powerful, it would actually drown out any other American interest stations in that, on that same frequency. And so Will Horowitz got a, uh, a station down in Reynosa called XED, and he got it in 1931, and uh, yeah, he started broadcasting from there, but he got in trouble with the federal government, and they actually caught him for, uh, in Mexico, there was a lottery going on that was illegal here in the United States, and since he still had interest in the United States, he was bringing lottery tickets over 
from from Reynosa, <laughs> and that's how they caught him because they couldn't know they didn't know how to catch him on the radio. The radio, thing. yeah. So they did. Oh, that's horrible. So like, they got him. Like so they, they got, got the phone. Yeah. yeah, they got it exactly. So uh, he served eighteen Details. months. He served eighteen months at Leavenworth, but he was so well liked in uh -huh. Houston because he had such a following during the Depression. He was such a, a philanthropist. He was a humanitarian that there was such an outcry for his release. And uh, apparently, yeah, because he served a, a lesser sentence because of that. And I understand, too, that Roosevelt even pardoned him. Wow. <laughs> you know? But That's yes, cool. yes. He was, he was credited with starting kind of like the, the whole border radio that went on for decades. Wolfman Jack, all of that, you know, yeah. is, is all... It was started from him, you know, and so and Governor Ross Sterling owned two ho two uh, buildings rather, uh, you know, across uh, Fannin Street, and he made a tunnel that connected those two buildings in the early early nineteen twenties, actually after nineteen twenty six, about late nineteen twenties. But Will Horitz also had a tunnel system. Talk about that tunnel system because it's one of the earliest ones that we can think of. And we have Sandra Lohr, the tunnel lady, coming on the show, and she talks about the, the modern day tunnel system that we all think of now. That you know, fourteen plus miles that we have connecting thirty three blocks. But talk about his tunnel system. Yeah, um, well, his Irish theater was came on in 1919. It was at Travis Street, right where the Chase Tower is yeah. at today. Yeah, in between Capitol and in between Texas Avenue Correct. on Travis, facing Travis, but he had another theater. Yeah, right across the street from Capitol was, uh, he opened up in 1925, the Texan Theater. So uh, it was uh, to, and he was, he was into air conditioning. So he had an air conditioning system and he wanted to power, or he wanted to serve both theaters. So what he did was he, underneath Capitol Street, he constructed a tunnel that would connect both of the theaters, and he had an air conditioning unit that would serve both of them. And so from there, apparently our tunnel system started from there. Uh, Bill Bremer says that Will Horwitz was the mattress Mac of his day. That's right. Very well loved, very, very well, well liked, and also involved civically in philanthropy. He, he may have even had the first air-conditioned uh, building in Texas with his Irish theater yeah. or his Texan theater. Makes you sense. Know. Yeah. Early yeah. 1920s. Yeah, okay. I'm, I've been researching that. I'll get back with you on that. <laughs> All right. This is a typical program that you would see printed up in a local newspaper in 1922. Notice the four stations there were W-E-A-Y. WEV, WCAK, and WGAB. Uh, this is a daily program, and so they all they all came out of uh, the uh, frequency of 360 meters, which in today's uh, frequency would be 832 kilohertz. So they would allocate their time. See, 11 o'clock here would come out of so DWAY. The, the, the larger there, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, WEV would broadcast their road conditions report at 10 a.m., so they would switch during the course of a day. They would allocate their, their broadcasting with each other. So they had to coordinate their days with each other. All right, so now we get to uh, 1925 here. And Alfred Patrick Daniel, after a few years of his WCAK, he was approached by Ross Sterling, who, ah. who had the, the Houston you know the Post. Ross Sterling, yeah. Had the Houston Post newspaper. Uh, he and this is the corner of, uh, this is uh, Polk, and, Polk Dowling. and Dowling right over here for context. Yeah. And this is not the current 1950s building that we see today that uh, the Lovett commercial is actually redoing. Uh, this is the older original building on the property. Talk about it. Yeah, this is the publishing plant for the Houston Post back in 1925. So yes, Ross Sterling had shown interest in getting a, a broadcasting station connection with the Houston Post. Around the country, other newspapers were doing the same, so he wanted to follow suit. Uh, he had a son, Ross Sterling Jr., who also was interested in radio and was actually getting instruction from Alfred Patrick Daniel in radio telegraphy. Tragically, uh, Ross Sterling Jr. drowned in 1924, so uh, any thought of, of getting a broadcasting, broadcasting station started were killed with that, and, and Ross Sterling Sr. just lost interest in it. But then in 1925, a, uh, a, a nationwide convention came to Houston, and Alfred Patrick Daniel came back to Mr. Sterling and said, why don't we get this station going again? So he convinced him to, to get it going, and on, in May of 1925, KPRC came on the air. Now, uh, the call letters stand for Cotton Port Rail Center. Once again, the title of your book, yeah. Alfred Patrick Daniel was trying to promote Houston. So those were the major industries of Houston at the time. 
the cotton importation, uh, the, the Port of Houston and, and, and you know, KPRC uh, 950 AM is, is still on the air now, mm -hmm. and there are other radio stations we're going to talk about that are still on the air as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that probably is the earliest uh, or the longest running commercial radio station still operating in Houston, 1925, would, that would be the case? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, of, the, of those four we saw earlier, yes, this is the only sur the, the earliest surviving. Earliest broadcast. surviving, yes, yeah, still in operation and still on the airwaves. Sandra Lord, by the way, did chime in. She said, uh, don't forget the Uptown Theater as well. So he had the mm -hmm. iris, the text, and the Uptown Theater. Absolutely. I think he had several more with this, uh, with this theater chain itself. But mm -hmm. uh, just really, uh, like Bill Bremer said, the mattress mac of his day. So here we go then. Yeah, uh, this is about 1927, and the gentleman that seated there is Olin Brown. He was an engineer of KPRC, and that was his wife. She served as the receptionist to the station. This was at the studios of KPRC in the, uh, the, the Houston Post building of 1927, uh, 22nd floor, uh, the penthouse of the building. And this is the studios for the... Uh, KPRC in 1927. And this moved. is now the Magnolia Hotel, by the way. So if you ever want to stay at the hotel, then you can have that connection to realize the building itself has a lot of history. Yeah, in 1925, the, the studios were there on top of the building of the publishing plant. But in 27, they moved over to the new studios here. Now, uh, we're starting now getting into um, corporate radio broadcasting. Um, NBC was coming around in the late 20s and KPRC uh, affiliated itself with NBC. So by this time, by the late 20s, we started getting uh, more uh, broadcasting around from around the, around the nation with NBC now. So KPRC was running feeds of NBC at night and during the day would run local feeds. All right, and in 1929, uh, they moved their transmitter out to Sugarland. This photo here is is is, a, is that is that transmitter, and uh, their studio stayed in downtown Houston, and you can see KPRC Houston Post Dispatch, and uh, very often uh, this was so remote out there that the engineers would live there. So this is Mrs. Olin Brown here, and they probably lived inside the transmitter. They had a home there. Uh, where they would uh, serve the, uh, the transmitter. And so now we also get to KTRH. KTRH came on the air in 1930 from the Rice Hotel. Their studios were in the Rice Hotel, the third floor. And you can see down here, home of radio station KTRH. So to clarify, KTRH stands for Come to the Rice Hotel. Once again, yes, they were advertising their agenda, yeah. in this case, they were advertising the Rice Hotel. So they would come on the air and say, come on to the Rice Hotel. We have live music tonight. We have a cafeteria, whatever, whatnot, and uh, come on out and, yeah, come and see us. Uh, Bill Bremer is adding a good comment. The person, he said, with Ruby Joe is what he's saying, I guess. Ruby Joe, that's Ruby Joe, Ruby Joe Brown standing is what Bill Bremer is adding to the conversation. Okay. Uh, however, she's not standing, she's sitting, but I assume that's who you're talking about. Ruby Joe Brown. Yes. And Bill Bremer has worked for many years at KPRC along with his wonderful wife, Pat. Uh, and he knows a lot about KPRC uh, television history, which also translates into radio history as well. So there you go. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And this is the transmitter for KTRH, Come to the Rice Hotel. This was out in Deepwater, which is near Pasadena, off of 225. And so, yeah, their transmitter was out there. And uh, it was also affiliated with CBS when it came on the air in 1930. Uh, Jesse Jones. Oh, actually, let's go backwards. What he's saying is that is Ruby Joe Brown standing in the snow. Yes. Uh, and you can see the snow on the vehicles. Well, so that is Ruby but, Joe Brown. But that's also her and the other previous. There you go. Olin Brown and Ruby Brown. Okay, there you go. And then she's out there, too. Yeah, that's like great. I said, they lived out there. Yeah. So when this transmitter came on, they had to live out there 24-7. You have to, to maintain it, to manage it. Okay, exactly. here we go. And this is uh, this was located where, 225 and? Yeah, deep water. You deep know, water area? P Pasadena. Okay. Right over there. Uh, there's still some kind of a studio. There's still kind of some kind of a transmitter out there. I don't know who owns it, but you can still see remnants of a transmitter out there off of 225 and Preston Street exit somewhere out there, Beale yeah. Street somewhere out there. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, they were affiliated by CBS, with CBS, as KPRC was part of NBC. 
uh, KTRH was part of CBS when it came on in 1930. Jesse Jones, who owned the Rice Hotel, was part of KTRH. And it makes sense. You got you got you know the Chronicle as well as what he owns as well. So you have this these media folks. Correct. They want a little bit of every empire right, to, to reach out as much as they can. So Sterling's got KPRC and the Post. Dispatch newspaper, and, and so does Jesse H. Jones with his KTRH. Okay, now what is this hotel, the Texas, the 1929 Texas State Hotel? What does it have to do with Houston radio history? There was also a, a KXYZ came on the air, and it was in the basement of this hotel, the Texas State Hotel. And uh, Jesse Jones also had a part of that as well. And uh, the transmitter was uh, the tower was on the next slide, please. There'll be on top of the building there. Uh, the Esperson Second National Bank and Gulf Building. So you see there's there. So there's the old Carter Building built in 1910. It used to be 16 stories tall, and they built these uh, six stories in 1926 when it was completed. But they had a radio antenna, and that antenna, we see this in a lot of photos, uh, you know, because, of course, this was built in 1929, which outdid uh, this building and all buildings in downtown Houston. But, uh, but that is so neat to know that that particular radio antenna was part of what radio station again? KXYZ. KXYZ. There you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, okay, a little bit of, of a postscript here of what happened to Alfred Patrick Daniel. I didn't cover this in my book, but uh, Alfred Patrick Daniel would stay with KPRC until his death in 1955. Uh, during that time, he would see FM come on. You can see KPRC started an FM station on Christmas Eve of 1946, and he was, he was given uh, the, 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 uh, the honor to be the first voice on their FM station. So he was the first announcer on their FM frequency. And then when uh, television came around, we now we talk about the next evolutionary step of communication, television, KPRC Channel 2, when it came on the air in 1950, Alfred Daniel was asked again to be the first person to appear. 19, 19, actually, it was uh, 49. Yeah, it was, it was, well, it was January 1st. Mm -hmm. no, oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Technically, we talked about this right. uh, because that show, and it changed its name. You're correct. Right. K-L-E-E -E was in yeah, 1949. And then Hobby, William Hobby bought it. Hobby finally bought it. And in 1950, uh, they turned it into KPRC. So they asked Alfred Daniel to be mm -hmm. the first person to appear on Channel 2. Wow. So, yes, KPRC. So when you see Channel 2, remember... Cottonport Rail Center. Now you know. Now, and this is a photo of Alfred Daniel in his older years uh, at KPRC. I love his dedication with one company from almost start to finish, really. Yeah. I mean, kind of mm -hmm. just the whole spectrum of it all. Yes. Uh, from the early days to the glory days to the golden years. Well, we are now towards the end of our program, but we have to ask five questions. So I hope these folks are chiming in because we're going to ask our author five questions. Uh, and we're going to let him ask y'all questions, too. Uh, so we got, now we ask five questions, and we have five prizes for guests on the next show. So they've got to tune in to watch all of your show, but also tune in the next show to be able to see who won those prizes. And everything is timestamped on Facebook, so make sure you do chime in right now with those uh, answers to your question. So first question, ask the audience out there a question that they would have only known if they would have listened to your program a couple minutes ago. Okay, what does KTRH stand for? Good question. What does KTRH stand for? What do the call letters KTRH stand for? Uh, we're chiming in. Let's see. We got, uh, by the way, thank you so much. John Kelly Jr. just chimed in. A gentleman uh, that you may know. His name is Jonathan Varela. Yes. Uh, you know him. He chimed yes. in too. My a little nephew. bit of family. Hey, Jonathan. Your nephew. Hey, Jonathan. What's going on, nephew? And then, of course, Bill Bremer's still with us. Sandra Lord is always tuning in. Phil Stewart, uh, our radio gentleman here, is tuning in as well. So that's the first question. Uh, what do the call letters KTRH stand for? Okay. So you can chime in right now with your questions. Let's see. Um, the next question. Where did Alfred Patrick Daniel serve in the Army? Oh, where? Okay, where? Now, where? where? So that was covered in the start in of World your... World War One. Okay. So where in World War One specifically did he serve in? Mm -hmm. Are we looking for a city, a state, a region? Or what did you say? Don't give the answer out, of course, but let's ask. A military uh, installment. Good. A military installment. Where was it? It was at the start of the program. Let's see. If, okay, people are chiming in. Phil Stewart chimed in. Catherine uh, uh, Fitzgerald uh, also um, uh, uh, chimed in as well. So, again, the question again. Where did, where did Alfred Patrick Daniel serve during World War I? Okay, where did he serve? We're looking for that answer. Okay, so chime in for that. Okay, the third question. Third question you have for the audience out there who watched the program, the entire program from the start. Tell us where. 
Well, let me think. You know, that's a question. What were um, what were um, those uh, devices that mm-hmm. were required mm-hmm. to run the radio uh, station, like the radio transmitter? What were those devices? And they were highly flammable. They were right there. It actually kind of shocked me. We actually we even had a zoom in photo, by the way, to show you kind of what we're looking at. But where what what were those uh, devices that were required? Highly flammable. And you made a good comment too. Don't mention what they're called because that's where we're going to people chime in. No one's chiming in just yet with the answer, so you have some time. But you told me a fun story, too. People actually had to have what kind of a policy? They had to get a certain fire insurance. So when, when amateur operators uh, would own a house and the insurance companies knew of their equipment, they were required to get a special fire insurance because of these device These device. Um, items that are needed. Okay. All right. So... Let people chime in with that answer too. Okay, the next question, uh, question number four, you get to ask question number four. Um, what was the first broadcasting station in Houston? Ooh. Broadcasting. Okay, be very, are we looking for? Starts with a W. Okay, we're looking for the call letters, looking for the letters over here. So chime in now with the very first broadcasting station, okay? Mm-hmm. Very first broadcasting station here in Houston. Uh, please chime in with those letters, okay? All right, the fifth and final question. All right, let's go to Will Horowitz. Uh, what was one thing we talked about, one of his achievements in this discussion? Okay, is it, well, he has lots of achievements. Is it a radio achievement or is it It could be a, other things we talked about. Anything, his engineering achievements that we talked about. Let's see. Or we could talk about anything he did with the radio. Let's see. Let's let's we'll, let, let's let's look for a number. Let's. I'm gonna. I'll ask this question. The fifth and final question will be this because it's a little easier for people to answer. It's not as vague. It's a very concrete answer, mm-hmm. and those are the ones we like for these uh, particular uh, uh, items. Let's talk about this. So, what was the year that the very first commercial radio station went on the air? Mm-hmm. Okay, the year. The very first commercial radio station, they happen to be, to this day, the longest running radio station in Houston, still in operation. So we're looking for the actual year, okay? It is not the first year that radio came to Houston. It's actually, what, about three years before that date. We're not going to give you the date, but you're going to give us the date because you're going to chime in right now. Okay, so once again, the Will Horowitz question we answered because Phil Stewart's awesome. He chimed in air conditioning at the Iris Theater. People also chimed in with the border radio phenomenon. People also (laughs) chimed in with uh, the luckiest guy with lottery tickets. Uh, So we're not going to go with those answers because we're going to answer a new question for our fifth one. The fifth question is going to be, what was the year the very first commercial radio station went on the air? Uh, And and if you need to know, you can look at the book over here because it's got wonderful (laughs) facts and information. Well... I think that's it for our time. I want to thank you so much for chiming in. Thank you for all the awesome folks that thank were seeing questions and, and answering the questions. Phil Stewart, Sandra Lord, Bill Bremer, uh, you know, uh, Andrew uh, Varela, uh, Dave Koken. Uh, all yes. these people are chiming in. Thank you again to the staff here. Thanks again to Christopher Varela for joining us. You can purchase his book. How can they get your book? Uh, just give me a call. I'm on Facebook, Christopher Varela. Okay. How about an email address? Uh, cvarela2 at juno.com. Gotcha cvarela2 at juno.com we're going to put that information on our next show that we have and we'll also put that in some of the links that we have as well but this book is not easy to find it's a rare book i've seen it on ebay by the way and amazon for up to a hundred dollars so it's a rare book he's not going to sell two for a hundred bucks uh you know but guess what you'll get a copy of the book at a nominal price so check out chris varela on uh, on his email account but we'll also give you that information as well Chock full of information. Every Houston historian should have this in their copy. Every Houstonian who loves about entertainment industry here should have a copy. Thank you again to Christopher Rella. Let's talk a little bit about KLVL. This is, of course, not early radio. This is more 1950s. But for the folks listening out there who, who want to learn, it's also Hispanic Heritage Month, too. Talk a little bit about KLVL. What do the letters stand for? Uh, La Voz Latina. Yeah. Right. And right. then who was the, 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 the brainchild behind this radio station? Felix Hesbrook Morales. He... Um, had a funeral home here in Houston, 1930 he started. And, uh, but he always had a, a love for radio broadcasting. And so he came from San Antonio and in the 1930s he was involved in radio broadcasting there. But when he got here, he wanted to get the station started. Uh, it took him 20 years to get it going though because of World War II restrictions and that kind of thing. But on uh, May the 5th of 1950, he came on the air with KLBL which is also Cinco de Mayo. And how appropriate. And his wife's birthday, too. His wife's too. birthday happened, Angela Morales. Well, had to be, happened to be his wife's yeah. birthday as well. And the transmitter was out in Pasadena. And they had two studios. They had a studio there in Pasadena 
they had a second studio at their funeral home. Next door, they had a little yeah. building, and they had their studio there. So yes, it is the recognized as the first Spanish-speaking station in Houston. Yeah, that, that's important. It's significant. It's part of again. It's part of that you know later part of the radio history. We were only covering and focusing on the early and the start of it all too. But it's important to mention as well because it has a lot of milestones. Uh, so thank you so much for talking about that. And it is Hispanic Heritage Month now until of course October fifteenth. And this is part of the mural that we have outside the Heritage Society. You're more than welcome to check it out. It talks about the history of Hispanic. Uh, contributions in the 20th century. So you'll learn a lot about folks in that time period here at the Heritage Society. So we want to thank you again, Christopher Bell, for joining us. We also lastly want to thank you for tuning in and we want to thank our staff, Alana, Isaac, Kian, Kai, uh, Ted, Tran over there as well. Thank you so much once again to Allison Ayers Bell, who is our executive director, Eminette Basil, our board chair. And thank you to you guys. Good night and, uh, and have a great night. We'll see you next week. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.